All right, welcome everybody. This is Alexander Lenderman with the third part of the video series on how to play with or against the isolated pawn. And now we're going to shift to examples of how to play against the isolated pawn. And in this game, I'm going to be showing you a game between Sokolov and Peter Leko. And Sokolov is a big expert on this line with e3. As far as I know, he wrote a book on this line. And Leiko is a well-known theoretician all around. So this will be an interesting battle of two very big opening specialists. Castles, bishop d3, c5, knight f3, d5, takes, and we eventually get this position, isolated pawn position. But now we'll see how Black handled it in a much better way than some previous guys did when they were black. So Black played a quick b6. Without knight c6, he just played a quick b6 to get this bishop out quickly and not running into d5 ideas. Bishop g5, bishop b7, rook c1. And he played h6 to question, ask the question to the bishop. Bishop h4. And now he played knight c6. So now, of course, d5 will never really be anything special. Not here, because of simply knight a5. The bishop will be attacked, and then black will take, and maybe win the pawn. So d5 is really not working here. Not with the bishop on c4. So he went back to d3. So maybe at some point he wants to do bishop b1, queen d3. The ideas that I've shown you before. Black plays a nice move, bishop e7. He realizes that the bishop on b4 doesn't do very much anymore, so he brings the bishop back to e7. And as you'll see, black has a very interesting defensive idea in mind, which is one of the more important defensive ideas that you have to know when you're defending against an isolated pawn. Bishop b1, rook c8, rook e1, and now knight h5. A key idea. And now this idea has to be with the bishop on h4. Because if the bishop was on g5, he can go back to e3. But now, the bishop will have to be traded. After bishop g3, for example, he'll just take and maybe play bishop f6. And he'll always be able to go g6 without having to worry about the h6 pawn. Simply because this bishop, the dark square bishop, got traded. I mean, maybe concretely here there's rook takes e6, but maybe it doesn't even work because of takes and bishop g7, and there seems to be no mate. But maybe we can do it accurately. Maybe you don't have to go bishop f6 right away. Maybe you can start with something else. And after bishop takes e7, the idea would be knight takes e7. And now the point would be to go knight f6. And simply... We got rid of one pair of minor pieces, and that means we got rid of a lot of attacking potential. And the knight on f6 will be a nice defender, where there's no dark square bishop to ever put pressure on him. And uh, one light square bishop won't really be able to do as much. And now black will be able to shift gears to simply coordinate his pieces to put pressure on this isolated pawn right here. So that's a really nice defensive idea, I think first used by Karpov, if I'm not mistaken. So, because of that, Sokolov tried an aggressive move, queen c2. But unfortunately, in this game, it just simply did not work. Black played g6, takes, and now knight f4. So I guess he was hoping for takes, rook takes g6 with a really complicated mess. And maybe he was hoping that this will be somehow in white's favor. Maybe some kind of a move like d5, and then bishop g6, who knows. It's really complicated. Maybe bishop g6 right away. But of course, Leiko saw that, and he did not allow it, and he had a nice intermediate move, knight f4. And unfortunately now, white's play has been pretty much refuted. Because now, if the rook moves, first of all, it defends rook takes g6. And if the rook moves, black will just simply take the bishop. And if white takes here, black takes here, and even though white won temporarily a pawn, but this bishop takes f3 is a giant threat with a huge attack now for black. 
For example, if rook e1, queen g5 is a threat, this will be a huge attack for black. Knight takes d4 is a threat, queen g5 is a threat, black is probably winning here. And if rook e3, once again knight f5 attacking the rook, and again white will have to give up an exchange in a bad version. So white desperately tried rook takes e7, but after takes, queen d2, g5, strong move, knight e5, there's just simply nothing, there's no serious attack. Knight takes g5 doesn't really work, you can check this game for yourself, but the point is that the attack doesn't really work for white. So he tried knight e5, with the idea of takes to take on f4, but he just played knight g6, and after takes, takes opening the f file, it was clear that white has no real play, he's just down material, and in fact it's black the one with initiative now. Defending g6, a3, desperation, trying to go bishop a2, but knight h4, bishop a2, queen takes a2, just refutes white's play, because after knight takes a2, why does black win here? Why did Sokolov resign? I'm gonna give you guys some time to see if you can pause the video. To see if you can find it. So you can pause the video right now if you want more time. So the idea is simple. Takes, takes, knight f3. King f1 only move. Otherwise knight e1 check. With the bishop discovery. Bishop a6 check. King g2. Knight e1. Picking up the rook. So you see how a nice defensive idea can pretty much induce opponent into an unsound attack. And just like that, you can win a very nice game. And that's against a really strong player, Sokolov, 2663, who is a specialist in this line. Now I want to show you a game where Karpov was white. And this time, you'll see a nice example where he showed how to play against the isolated pawn. So here he's white, in a French defense, Tarish French, and black took back with the e pawn. Queen takes d5 is another very critical popular move. But uh, he took with the e pawn, which is playable, getting this isolated pawn structure. And you'll see how white played really nicely against this isolated pawn. Bishop here, takes, takes, 97. Bishop d6, and he develops the bishop to g5 in order to potentially trade the bishops from h4 to g3 and get rid of this dangerous potential attacker, the dark square bishop. Bishop h4, so you see his priority first of all is to trade the bishops, and then he goes on and sees where he should put his pieces. And he's not afraid of bishop takes f3 gf because now white has a nice square king g2 and then rook h1 has a lot of pressure. Rook d6, f4, rook fd8, and now a very nice move a3 with the purpose of on d4 to play b4. Possibly black should have tried d4 right away. But even still. After takes, 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 white should be better because in an open position the bishop is normally better than the knight. Maybe white can play something else. But after this, a3, I would say white has a solid advantage. So black tried h5, but he's playing on the side where he's potentially weaker. Rook e2, and really black's attack is not going anywhere. And now white very nicely improves his piece that's not very active and consolidates the king's side. And now g4. He's putting pressure on the king's side and uh, kicking away this rook from h6. 
just simply expanding. And again, black doesn't have any active ideas. And finally, a really nice move, King g3, consolidating, and eventually he just wants to go rook h2, trade the rooks, and just mate the guy. Very simple. Knight c5, bishop f5, g6. And now a very nice intermediate move b4. Because of course after bishop here, knight e4 would be the idea. So b4, knight e4. Knight d7 didn't work because of a sacrifice on g6. So here takes, takes, queen takes e4, king g7, b5, knight a5, queen e7. Now queen takes c3 doesn't work because the attack is too strong, like rook e3, followed by, let's say, knight e5, queen f6, like for example, queen here, rook e2, and just no play. So he tried trading the queens, but that didn't help very much either. King g4, rook f8, rook e7, and now because of the threat of knight e5, black resigned the game. And one more game I wanted to show, well, maybe two more. So this game between Korchner and Karpov, so you might be wondering where I learned the idea of knight h5. This is where. Famous game between Korchnoi and Karpov. Back in 1981 match. So we have a queen's gambit declined, trancing posing into an isolated pawn position, and there you go, this idea, knight h5. Trading the bishop. And remember, it has to be with the bishop on h4, so that the bishop cannot go back to e3. And you'll see how black, in a very nice way, just simply outplayed black outplayed white so 94 is a mistake of course trading off pieces when we have a nice third pawn is normally not a very good idea unless your piece is much worse than your opponents and after bishop c6 he traded once again i guess what he was thinking was that he will take with the knight and then he'll get d5 in but that was not meant to be karpov correctly took with the rook and now, after rook c3, well, maybe uh, he should have tried this, but then he would have taken with a pawn, and then he would go queen d6, rook d8, and then just play knight f5 and simply start attacking this pawn, and this pawn on d4 somehow becomes weaker than the pawn on c6. So, rook c1, that was the reaction, so he played rook c3, queen d6, g3, rook d8, rook d1, rook b6, and now he was able to keep the rook on to put pressure here. Queen e1, queen d7, very nice idea, with the idea of going rook d6, rook d3, rook d6, queen e4, queen c6. So he always wants to trade queens because if queen takes, here he has just knight b4. So slowly but surely he Surrounds the pawn in a very nice way. And he traded, which is probably a mistake, but if not, then again, there will be plans with like 97, 95, building up pressure on the pawn. But after he took, maybe he seemed he can protect this position, but it's not to be. Because e5 is coming and uh, eventually the pawn is going to be lost. So you see how these kind of trades just don't help the side with the isolated pawn. Eventually you see how this pawn can just become weak and eventually surrounded and eventually probably won. And he tried a 4 but now that's too weakening. The king becomes too weak. b6, rook b4, d5. That's big subtlety. Takes. a5. Queen b5. e5. And finally he breaks through to start attacking the king. And this would be bad because the rook takes d2. And huge attack. And queen e8, really strong move. Threatening rook e1. Queen e7. And now black wins because of a big attack. Queen f1. 
check and check and rook d1 coming next and black won the game. So you guys see how first you have one plan putting pressure on the pawn and then because of that weakness white can make some other concessions and then due to other concessions you can sometimes win for a completely other reason. But the main cause of the loss for white was still ultimately the isolated pawn because the isolated pawn was the reason why he created all of these other weaknesses. Okay, and one more game I wanted to show you is my coaches, Georgi Kachashvili was white against a strong grandmaster from Israel, Michael Royce. And Georgi in this game was white and he played this e3, Nimzo. And as you'll see actually, Sometimes you can get a nice third pawn position. Well, I mean, sometimes when you're playing the Rubinstein Nimzo, sometimes you can actually give your opponent a nice third pawn too. Sometimes even that happens. And here white played a nice move h3, because if he goes b3 right away, black will play bishop g4, an annoying pin. So he played h3, queen e7, and now b3. Rook d8, and now... One more thing I wanted to show you involving isolated pawn is this nice maneuver, knight e2. Simply trying to go bishop b2 and then controlling some dark squares. This was an idea used by Nimzovich, as far as I know. And uh, once again, white outplayed very nicely black in this game. So black played knight e4, trying to get some activity. Now trading right away might not be very good because Black will get his queen very active, or maybe even bishop d6. But so, for a concrete reason, this trade here isn't good, but there's no rush. Knight of 4, threatening bishop b2. And again, black's activity is more or less neutralized because white build up a really nice harmony against black's attacking ideas. And black found nothing better than to just trade off these bishops, but of course a plan like that is passive and after a strong move rook b1, which allows this rook to be activated with a tempo, once again black has a prospectless position with this isolated pawn, suffering for the whole game. And Georgie played really really nicely here. He activated all his pieces. Now he went knight back to e2, taking away attacking active ideas from black. And now he traded queens. And now e takes a 4, very interesting idea. Maybe knight takes a 4 was also good, but Georgia had a nice idea in mind. Knight d4, f3, g4. And just putting a lot of pressure on the king side. While this isolated pawn is still controlled pretty heavily by white's pieces. This was an idea once used by Botvinnik, if I'm not mistaken. So here g4, f3, and now the king comes in the game, white has a space advantage, now black wants to go bishop b5 maybe at some point, trading this bishop, so bishop b1, also something to keep in mind, this bishop on d7 is not a good piece, it's blocked in by its own pawn, and it has no prospects, so that's why this kind of trade white does not want, because this bishop on b1 is very important, it takes away black's active ideas. So not all trades just automatically are good for a person playing against isolated pawn. Sometimes you have to realize that white's bishop has a better role than this bishop. h4, threatening g5, takes, takes, bishop here, king e3, rook d8. And now king comes all the way march to d4 in a very active square. And slowly but surely killing all the counterplay. Black found nothing better than to trade rooks. And uh, he penetrated with the king. And here black resigned because after takes knight f5 is really strong, followed by knight takes h6 and the h pawn queens. And after g6, I think he was maybe afraid of bishop takes and then f7. And uh, looks like the pawn might queen. Or it might be some other line, it might be actually g5 first, and black is sort of in Zugzwang. Although, maybe he resigned a little bit prematurely, I mean, I think I remember George showed me this game and he said that there were some practical chances. But the point is that 
White is actually winning this position. And the uh, point is that the strategical battle was won by White. And uh, once again, the isolated pawn in this case was beaten. So as you guys see, isolated pawns are really tricky. Sometimes you can have a really nice attack or really nice pressure having the isolated pawn, but sometimes it might turn into a weakness. How to get better at understanding when when is the isolated pawn good and when it is not as good? Well, I'll give you guys some homework. I'll give you some puzzles to try to see if you can solve them. And uh, hopefully the more experience you have playing with isolated pawns and against them, hopefully the better you'll become. So until next time, this is Alexander Lenderman signing off. Thank you very much for watching this video.